great privilege and honor to uh, welcome Dr. Naveen uh, from the Naveen Garden. Many of you can know about his uh, garden. He is one of the environmental uh, protector and uh, he is very famous for his uh, Pasumai Kavlan Award. And I am very happy to inform that he is an alumnus of our college. He finished his undergraduation on zoology and his post-graduation in the Department of Biotechnology. And we are very pleased to invite him for this session. We welcome and thank you, sir. Please carry on. Good afternoon, everyone. So. Happy Ozone Day. So today's seminar is conference on sustainable living and climate adaptation and the resilience. So I am going to take integrated form management for sustainable agriculture. This is not a seminar. So I'm just I'm going to explain how I am living with with my pets in my form sustainably. Okay. Just I'm going to explain my lifestyle. How I am sustainably living in my form. Okay. So what is integrated form? Integrated form management is a whole form management system which aims to deliver more sustainable agriculture. It's a dynamic approach which can be applied to, to any farming system around the world. Okay. Integrated farming calls, it's a different type of activities called dairy farming, goat farming, uh, fisheries, poultry, pet breeding, so horticulture, sericulture, apiculture, it's all called the integrated form. How we are integrate all the aspects in the form is integrated farming management system. Okay. So what is the five benefits of farming or agriculture? Farming is good for your health. Being a farmer is challenging and stimulating work. It provides a source of income in rural areas. Farm work helps develop younger generations. Farming can help the environmental thrive. So whenever I'm going to some meeting seminars, everyone will call, why are you not going to abroad and all? So more than 17, 18 years I'm doing farming. No? So everywhere I'm going, no? everyone will ask, why are you doing farming? It's possible, it's possible to sustainable and all. So I'm always wondering, what is in that? So we are earning, that's all. What is means by sustainable living? So sustainable living means when we talk about living in a sustainable way, we are generally talking about developing ways to live that don't harm the environment or that cause the lowest possible impact on it. What is mean by sustainable living? So, when we talk about living in a sustainable way, we are generally talking about developing ways to live that don't harm the environment or that cause the lowest possible impact on it. So, what is sustainable living? So, stopping the use of plastics, reducing the household energy, finding, creating, using of everything, recycle everything. Okay, living sustainably means that people try to manage their needs in a way that will allow future generation to do the same. Principles of sustainable living, effective land use and wildlife protections, sustainable water usages, sustainable local and organic foods, the use of sustainable materials, the use of sustainable transport, zero waste and zero carbon, creating own healthy environment, and realize local and culture values. These are all principles of sustainable living. Everyone will follow this. 
So I am following every this, every one of this. Next. So what is the importance of land use? So when I entered my farm, so 2005, the land was in barren, unbarren land, so non-fertile land. So first I created land in the proper way and cleaned everything and started rain-fed uh, rain crops like tapioca, mices, pulses, everything. Then I converted into fertile land. Okay. So land use and land management practices have a major impact on natural resources, including water, soil, nutrients, plants, and animals. Land use information can be used to develop solutions for natural resources, management issues such as salinity and water quality. So what is the importance of land use? So land use for different purposes such as agriculture, um, malls, theaters, schools, colleges, industry, something like that. But if you convert into agriculture only, it will be a sustainable. Okay. So importance of land use is the main thing of sustainable living. Then effective land use and wildlife protection. What do you mean by uh, wildlife protection? What is the importance of wildlife protection? So as part of the world ecosystem, wildlife is giving the proper balance and the stability of nature process. Okay, so we have to give importance to wildlife protection also. To try wildlife need a place to live and their interactions with the humans need to be healthy. The goal of land use, planning for wildlife coexistence is to ensure that animals have space and resources. So we have to give proper shelters and way of wildlife protections also. Sustainable water usage. So around 70% of water we are using for agriculture purpose, more than other, uh, other 10 to 15% we are using for food processing and storage. So we have to be very careful for the water storage in the agriculture field. Sustainable water management means using water in a way that meets current ecological social and economic needs without compromising the ability to meet those needs in the future. Okay, so this is my farm tank. Actually, my farm is full of uh, dry land development. So 2005, I started uh, collecting water in the small tank, big tank. Then I started building proper construction tank. We are using for multi-purpose tank. So we are collecting water, we are collecting uh, rainwater or rainwater harvesting, then fish breeding and swimming pool. Okay. So we have to think uh, integrated in the farm. Stopping local and organic foods. How to support organic, how to support local farmers. So we have to buy from local. So spread the word to others, corporate event and educational programs. Organic farming lovers, the risk of, lower the risk of environmental pollution and helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions by severely restricting the use of manufacturing chemical fertilizers. Okay. The use of sustainable materials. The systemic approach to using the reusing materials more productively over their enriched life cycle. It's response to a change in how our society thinks about the use of natural resources. So we have to find out the material first, source the material more locally, decrease the transport of emission, and use the reclined post-industrial grades or secondary plastics and all. Okay. So the use of sustainable transport, so everyone knows about that. Sustainable transport refers to any means of transportation that, that is green and has low impact on the environment. Sustainable transportation is also about balancing our current and future needs. Example of sustainable transportation includes walking, cycling, and transit carpooling, car sharing, and green vehicles. Zero waste is a holistic approach to addressing the problem of understable resource flows. Zero waste encompasses waste eliminated at the source of through product design and producer responsibility and waste uh, re reduction strategies further down the supply chain, such as recycling, reuse, and recomposing. So recycle is the main aspect in the integrated form. So we have to recycle everything. We have to use maximum level. 
so here after we can't uh, stop plastic usage and all now at least we have to recycle in a proper manner otherwise we can't uh, use recycle and we can't run the integrated form we can't live sustainably okay so creating our own healthy environment so everyone have to ask ask yourself is your work environment is comfortable correct so i proudly say i am environmentally comfortable in my place this is navin garden oh, sorry so this is navin garden entrance i am comfortably with uh, sustainable environment sustainable agriculture living okay so offering personalized benefits are a great start towards improving employee productivity rethink your workplace according to the future workplace study air quality lightning and temperature rank as the top factors for positive influence on wellness so ask yourself if your work environment is comfortable so are you comfortable in your place so i am more comfortable in my workplace realize local culture values so everywhere we will conduct uh, pongal celebration uh, deepavali eco friendly deepavali all festivals will conduct so we will call all of our families and friends to get together we will discuss then we will play for our uh, native games and everything so culture values bind people together which makes them strong and united it makes people learn tolerance and understand brotherhood which pass path of social harmony economic improvement and physical well being of the community and the others so culture values enhance our uh, quality of life and increase the overall well being for both uh, individuals and community why is important to live sustainably so sustainable living uh, will reduce crime conserve valuable resources reduce waste attract viable economic development preserve natural beauty and culture and bring communities together so when a community practices sustainable living they help the environmental quality maintaining a sustainable lifestyle helps reduce your carbon footprint when a community pursues sustainability air pollution reduces clean air is key to a healthy community so in my form i uh, named o2 zone so clean air is key to healthy community what are the benefits of live sustainability one of the core advantages of sustainability living is that it helps protect the planet for future generations as more people live sustainably greenhouse gas emissions decrease helping to heal the planet for the future efficiency lead to less pollution with sustainability so more health benefits will be there living a sustainable lifestyle is a sure way of attaining increased fitness and improved life balance better and more stable planet for future generations maximizing energy and water efficiency sustainable and durable products what is a good example of sustainability using these cloths or ra rags to clean up messes instead of paper towards wipes the foundations of environmental sustainability are safeguarding water saving the energy reducing waste using recycling packages limiting or eliminating the use of plastics using sustainable transport reusing paper and protecting flora and fauna so in my area i have created wild forest mini forest so it creates more uh, habitat for uh, birds and many birds and many animals okay what makes agriculture sustainable so i am using all my farm photos only i didn't take any photo single photo in uh, internet it's all and uh, about uh, my farm photos so what makes agriculture sustainable so sustainable agriculture must provide a fair and reasonably secure living for farm families it should minimize harm to the natural environment it should maintain basic natural resources such as healthy soil clean water and clean air why sustainable agriculture is important sustainable agriculture must nurture healthy ecosystems and support the sustainable management of land water and natural resources while ensuring world food security 
what are the three main goals of sustainable agriculture uh, sustainable agriculture integrates three main goals one is environmental health and economic profitability and social equity environmental health so in addition to preserving the earth's natural resources sustainable agriculture benefits the environment through helping maintain soil quality reducing erosion and preserving water economic profitability so economic profitability what is agriculture profitability being a profitable means that the farming is creating enough money to pay the employee and the bills repay loans and provide a farmer with enough earnings to make a living so sustainable measures will benefit the farm's bottom line growing net value steadily declining debt and a constantly profitable farm throughout the time are all signs of farm's economic profitability direct efforts are produced through management marketing and decision making expertise social equity so sustainable agriculture system will require improved equity justice well being and dignity for farm workers farmers should have access to land financial resources informations and educational and professional facilities 10 best eco friendly farming practices to ensure sustainability organic agriculture organic agriculture rotating crops and embracing the diversity planting cover crops and perennials reducing or eliminating tillage applying integrated pest management integrated livestock and crops adopting agroforestry practices managing whole system and landscape renewable energy resources and wind breaks and shelter bird so organic agriculture so everyone will know the organic agriculture organic farming is a farming method that only use natural pest control and biological fertilizers to grow crops without using chemicals or pesticides the method optimizing the energy and nutrient cycles in the agriculture ecosystem research shows that fertilization increases the organic carbon in the soil leading to the huge release of co2 into the atmosphere organic agriculture practices with the help farmers to reduce the emission of nitrous oxide and methane from the soil that is why this method positively impact water the surroundings wildlife plant the atmosphere and farmers in the long run rotating crop and embarrassing diversity crop rotation helps improve the soil diversity by changing crop residues and rotating pattern so different crops benefit different species and so a range of crops will lead to more diverse and healthy soil microbial communities planting cover crops and perennials so a cover crop pro provides a natural means of supporting soil diseases pests it can also serve as a mulch or cover as assist in suppressing weed growth a cover crop can provide high quality material for grazing livestock or haying and can provide food and habitat for wildlife beneficial insects and pollinations reducing or eliminating tillage reducing tillage or conservation tillage is a practice for minimizing soil disturbance and allowing crop residue or stubble to remain on the ground instead of being thrown away in incorporate into the soil applying integrated pest management integrated pest management ipm is on effective environmentally sound approach to pest management it provides for the protection of beneficial insects as well as prevention of secondary pest outbreaks pest re resurgence and the spread the disease integrated livestock and crops the combination of livestock and crop which was very common in the past is assumed to be a viable alternative to specialized livestock or cropping systems mixed crop livestock systems can improve nutrient cycling while reducing chemical inputs and generate economics of scope at farm level this is all my livestock farm so first one is pygmy goat so if you grow regular uh, animals and all it's very tough to economic breed but if you grow like pet animal or uh, swine sheep 
donkey farm to fancy chickens it's you will sustainably easily you can uh, economically we can well be okay so adopting agroforestry practices the agroforestry system can provide a range of environmental sciences for example they can improve soil fertility protected crops and livestock from wind restore degraded lands improve water conservation limits pests and prevent soil erosion so managing whole system and landscape the main purpose of landscaping is to create a joyful environment around the building and give the occupants a healthy breath good appearance and natural beauty landscape design enhances the aesthetic appeal of a building it entitles planning for the space outside or surrounding say construction or a building renewable energy process so renewable energy sources according to fao energy from the agri la agri food chain contributes of 30% of the global ghg emissions thus renewable sources of energy such as solar energy hydro power and wind farms should be used for powering agriculture in this method solar panels are useful to run pumping and heating systems farmers can also use the hydrolytic power from a nearby river from various farming machineries to find the best alternative power sources for their farm farmers are suggested to compare the energy rate using on online energy comparison site wind breaks and self shelter belts they are they can reduce the soil erosion increasing crop yields and to protect livestock from heat and cold wind breaks can shield buildings and road from drifting snow they beaut beautify the landscape and provide travel routes and habitat for wildlife wind breaks can also be sources of wood and food what are the three parts of sustainable living sustainable have three main pillars economic environment and the social these three pillars are informally referred to as people planet and the profit so economic so it measures the sustainability from the view point of the consumer that culture treating finite resources of nature as an income that will result in the aversion of natural resources sustainability should generate economic wealth in a local regional and global framework that stimulates financially possible and profitable development maintaining the base of natural resources and their conservation social sustainability answer to need to improve the quality of life of the populations as a whole and to seek for social solution as well as to preserve natural capital and the quality of the environment for future generations this should be achieved through changing personal and collective attitudes and practice where people care about others and value so social justice education health peace and tranquility improving and maintaining the global quality of human life over generations environment environmental sustainability aims to improve human welfare through the protection of natural capital example land air water mineral etc so conclusion so growing upon the farm i developed a work ethic and a sense of responsibility for my actions i am making it possible to protect the environment of the earth through integrated farming i can state with confidence that integrated farming system is beneficial for a sustainable way of life thank you Thank you sir for sharing your inspiring works and setting an example for sustainable living. Okay. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, thank you all. Thank you sir. Now I call upon Dr. Daisy Carlin Mary Assistant Professor Department of Environmental Sciences to introduce Dr. G Christopher
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, at this moment, I'm so happy to introduce to you all about Dr. G. Christopher, who is currently a scientist and research coordinator in the Advanced Center of Environmental Studies and Sustainable Development in Mahatma Gandhi University, Kottayam, Kerala. And uh, he, um, though that was the current uh, position, he had been working at various levels um, as research coordinator and program manager in the field of uh, eco-restoration in six different Indian states. And he had also been a program executive in um, uh, uh, program coordinator in Loyola College, Trivanandapuram, and also a program officer uh, for f more than 200 multidisciplinary projects funded by the Dutch Ministry of External Affairs. And he had also been a uh, research associate, associate for the Kerala Forest Research Institute for many years in Kerala. And uh, apart from that, um, uh, he uh, has uh, completed more than 20 projects and currently he's he has about three projects with him, and he has guided uh, five PhD students and four MPhil students. And um, he has uh, um, uh, papers, research papers published uh, with more than 32, and he has, um, uh, to his credit, attended um, about more than 30 uh, seminars and workshops. And he is also a member of many professional bodies, uh, including the Institutional Animal Ethics Committee and uh, District Environmental Impact Assessment Committee in Kotayam. And he's a life member of Bombay, uh, sorry, Malabar Natural History Society, Kori Code, and life member of Madras Naturalist Society, and member in the Important Bird Areas Program. And, um, and one important thing uh, which I need to mention is uh, he had also um, worked as a program executive of a community-based HIV AIDS care and support program in Tamil Nadu. So you would be wondering, um, he had so many um, nature-related, environment-related rela credentials, and at the same time he has also been working in a community-based HIV AIDS project. So uh, how come that happened is because he, uh, though he had his uh, graduated in the depart from the Department of Zoology from Bishop Weber College, then he obtained his uh, master's in social work from Bishop Weber College, Trichy. And then he uh, also um, finished his MPhil in social work uh, on deforestation and tribal livelihood, which might be the connection link which had initiated him from a uh, switch over from uh, social work to environment or nature. Then, um, uh, then he uh, that led into the entrance into the PhD program on forestry. So he had a, so from zoology to social work. Then he. Uh, ended up in PhD in forestry uh, and uh, that was not the end but so that was the beginning uh, for his career in uh, environment and nature so which has uh, led him to specializations in uh, wildlife biology uh, western guards Himalayan um, wildlife and so on so he is uh, very much uh, integrated in his work in community as well as wildlife. And um, so uh, I think that he's an appropriate person to be invited to give us a briefing on uh, the wildlife too. Um, so with this, uh, I hand over the session to the next person. Thank you, ma'am. Now I invite Dr. R. Carlton, Assistant Professor, Department of Environmental Sciences, to honor Dr. G. Christopher.
Let us welcome Dr. G. Christopher, Scientist and Research Coordinator of Advanced Center of Environmental Studies, Sustainable Development, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotem, to share with us his views on climate change and Himalayan ecosystem. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah. uh, how much time I have? Some uh, 30 minutes uh, or 40 minutes? Now it is uh, almost 12.50, 12 uh, 12.50, 1.30, I can go up to 1.30, okay. Uh, this is a very tough task <laughs> and uh, uh, just like actually the, uh, the topic which I am going to talk is Himalayas, it's a very vast area, vast means actually uh, we have started some uh, talks, the travelers, club in our university. We have been uh, talking uh, days together and it is not able to reach anywhere about Himalayas and uh, something like that. I will try to actually put a very uh, brief, uh, scattered uh, things about Himalayan uh, ecology. And I'm, uh, first of all, I'm, uh, it's a great privilege for me as uh, Dr. Daisy mentioned. Uh, I could meet actually so many of my colleagues, uh, my age group, people who all teach us here now, uh, including the principal and uh, vice principal are all my seniors, and uh, it's a great privilege of uh, studying in Bishop Eva College, uh, five years means it molded my best years, and all my academic and uh, scientific uh, thinking, like uh, Professor Edwin Chandrasekhar and uh, some of the professors I had to mention, Professor Daniel Wesley, and uh, even in social work, uh, Relton and uh, many, all, all are uh, though Relton is also a uh, social work uh, teacher, he was more uh, inclined towards nature and wildlife, uh, even that time. And, uh, so it's no doubt that actually the institution shaped my uh, interests, many things. And I'll go uh, fast. My uh, given topic is actually climate change. I'm not going to uh, bore you with a lot of statistics and uh, typical theoretical aspects. And uh, what I, uh, as uh, Professor Moses, uh, told me to share mo most of my experiences because I had a, very, very few people got the privilege of uh, traveling across Himalayas. And uh, I am one, I believe, it's a great privilege God gave me and I could uh, travel across the Himalayas, both the uh, Eastern Himalayas uh, from China to Western Himalayas uh, uh, up to Pakistan border and across the Himalayas and I could uh, uh, really witness the diversity and the amazing uh, uh, beauties and uh, depths of uh, Himalayan uh, ecosystem. And uh, uh, let us actually uh, go to the next. Uh, the, the peak actually I'm showing is the Nanda Devi peak. You should know that actually one of the uh, the second highest peak in India, one of the very prestigious peak. You should know that everybody. Yeah. Next. Next slide, please. I can change from here. This is the I, I first first part. Actually, I'll give you some broad uh, idea about the Himalayan ecosystem and the uh, Himalayan geography and the Himalayan uh, the layout. Uh, and the second part, actually, I will go into the uh, ecosystems and the. Last part, actually, I'll tell, uh, in between, I'll mention about the problems of climate change, what is happening in different uh, eco parts of the Himalayan system. And uh, as you see, this is the broad map of uh, Himalayas. It is actually uh, starts from Afghanistan side, the Pamir mountain, and uh, that's a different group. And the Karakoram is there. And uh, some people uh, include Afghanistan also in uh, Himalayan stretch, but in most of the literature you can see that it starts from Pakistan. But the uh, easternmost part of uh, Afghanistan is also the starting point of the Himalayas. It ends actually into the China. Part of uh, Myanmar is also in the eastern side, uh, comes into that, but uh, many don't acknowledge that. Uh, otherwise, uh, oh, apart from these two, five nations are included in the Himalayan landscape and uh, uh, 
significant portion is in the China and Nepal part, and uh, we have also a good part of the eastern, western uh, Himalaya. satellite image of the Himalayan ranges, you can see that uh, see this is, this is the Nepal range and uh, this is the, uh, the eastern Himalayas actually we call it as this portion is called eastern Himalayas which is one of the richest biodiversity hotspot uh, having more than 10,000 uh, plant species and a lot of birds uh, it is a uh, Indo Chinese, Indo Malayan, uh, many, many uh, converge, converging area. And uh, this is uh, equally the Western Himalayas is, uh, that has a different uh, ecosystem and the altitude and everything. And, uh, this spot is actually uh, called as the Indian uh, Himalayan region, IHR, it is uh, uh, mentioned as. And it starts from the uh, uh, what is actually now split? Uh, this is uh, though it is uh, mentioned as Kashmir, uh, Jammu and Kashmir district. This this portion is in the Pak Pakistan occupied Kashmir area. That Gilgit Baltistan, that area is called. This is uh, China uh, is holding that, and this is further splitted into J and K and now uh, Ladakh region. Uh, the two states it is splitted, and these all very interesting uh, high altitude. Arid ecosystem area and uh, Nepal is another country. It holds the large area of Himalayas, uh, including the Everest, the la world the largest uh, highest peak. And uh, another beautiful uh, Himalayan part is the Bhutan, a small country here, and uh, that holds some of the pristine areas of the Himalayan, eastern Himalayan ecosystem. And uh, uh, in most most cases, actually, we don't consider the seven sisters of the northeastern states. Uh, they are actually considered separately. Usually, the Kasi and Garo Hills they have uh, different culture and uh, different interaction section. But uh, for the conservation sake, uh, nowadays actually it is considered as a Indian Himalayan region. And uh, physiographically, the Himalaya we have to look into a broad perspective. Actually, we can look into the vertical as well as horizontal uh, level of uh, Himalayas to understand. And uh, these are the three broad classification of the uh, altitudinal Himalayas. The Trans Himalayas is the uh, uppermost level, which is dry and uh, no rainfall or less rainfall. And the greater Himalayas are the highest peaks, all this Everest, Nanda Devi, all these uh, highest peaks are in the greater Himalaya. Uh, which is not inhabitable again. Uh, um, uh, the altitude and the vegetations are less. The altitude is very high. Oxygen is very low. And uh, the lesser Himalayas are the lower, uh, uh, the green area belt, which includes uh, all the uh, uh, tourist and our uh, human habitations. Uh, very rich, diverse uh, area. Himalayan ecosystem, uh, some of you, I don't know whether how many of you have visited uh, some of these at least uh, tourist spots like Nainital or Kashmir or Srinagar and all. Uh, it's a very delicate system. Actually, it is a combination of uh, so many microsystems. And as I told, actually, the eastern Himalayas is different from the western Himalayas. Altitudinally, the temperature, vegetation, uh, flora, fauna, many things are different. Even the people, culture also. And uh, again, uh, the latitudinally also actually there is a difference. Uh, the lower Himalayas, the bent Himalayas are different, the climatically. Uh, what happens is in the climate change context, this so far the differentiation is slightly changing. It is crossing across. And that makes a lot of other differences. And uh, uh, the importance, other importances are actually the biodiversity owners because in the world, uh, uh, 32 biodiversity hotspots, the eastern Himalayas uh, stands one of the sig significant area. Uh, then the, comes our western Ghats, southern western Ghats. Eastern Himalayas still 
a uh, lot of new species are uh, scientists and explorers are finding and uh, people there are so many tribal communities and indigenous culture including the ladakis arunachal communities and this uh, it is all uh, you won't believe actually their cultural varieties and diversities uh, such a uh, large number of people uh, have mentioned uh, 51 million more than that people are actually living along the himalayan frontier and their way of life uh, cultivation and uh, trade commerce tourism so many uh, activities actually involved in this thing so and <coughs> it is a river a source of major rivers that you all know that actually uh, uh, major indian rivers like uh, ganges yamuna indus all this all originating from the himalayas apart from that uh, the world lo largest rivers like uh, the yangtze mekong which all flowing through the china and other southeast asian countries that also originates uh, from the uh, northern northeastern part of the himalayas It influences, that is why actually this influences not only the Himalayan terrain, it influences somebody actually in the morning uh, mentioning uh, Professor uh, uh, Oshi and uh, uh, others also mentioned about it, how actually the one place, the, the climate will impact the others. The Himalayan climate, the change will impact all the associated, it, it will affect even the Mekong Delta of uh, Vietnam, Southern Vietnam, because the water flow, the fishing community, they depend actually the flow and uh, the minerals from the Himalayas. Like Bangladesh, the flood, the torrential rain in uh, uh, mid Himalayas that affects the flooding uh, all the, the entire Bangladesh. So Assam, our Kasiranga is actually affected because of the changes. Something like that. It is highly, this is one way, direct uh, impact. Secondly, the uh, it influences the climatic condition of the central India and the Gangetic plains. Their cultivation, the rainfall, uh, so many things actually, the Himalayan mountains and the glaciers, which I'll come back to, uh, it, it impact. And the, uh, this is the ecological zones of the Himalaya uh, terrain. And uh, uh, based on the altitude, it has been uh, broadly classified into Subtropical uh, is the foothills, the Terai or the Shivalik region, that is the Daradun, our uh, Jim Corpet National Power Canal situated in this area. And uh, uh, Daradun is there, Rajaji National Park, many national parks and wildlife sanctuaries uh, falls under this area. A uh, lot of uh, sol and uh, deciduous forest are there, uh, elephants, tigers, and good. Uh, even in uh, Nepal side, the Royal Chitwan National Park is there. Assam, the Kaziranga is there. It, it supports uh, huge wildlife and uh, national parks, protected areas are uh, there. And it's a rich base of the Himalaya. And uh, the warm temperate is uh, slightly higher. Uh, the, uh, most of the important uh, destinations, the colonial destinations like uh, Darjeeling, um, our uh, Nainital, Shimla, all this area comes in the, under that lot of human habitations, developed uh, cities, everything is situated in both areas the because of the climate and um, a lot of activities, human activities goes there, uh, huge number of development and activities are happening in that area and uh, the cool temperate is little bit above the Manali uh, area or uh, Srinagar and uh, these are the areas good agricultural areas, apple and uh, apricot, uh, buckwheat, and so many other uh, rare temperate crops are cultivated in this zone, uh, prunes and plums, a lot of, most of our fruits are, uh, good fruits are coming from that area. And uh, uh, the subalpine are uh, about 3000 meters altitude, mostly the pine forests. Uh, we have around uh, uh, 12 species of uh, the more, there are more pine varieties and junipers and devdar and so many important chirpine, uh, interesting species of commercially both as well as ecologically important species of uh, pine forest we have at the subalpine terrain. And <coughs> just above that, most of the, the subalpine is the tree line, we call it as, where the trees end there. 
beyond that there will be it it gradually uh, lesson into small shrubs rhododendron shrubs i'll show you some of the pictures next and uh, some of the himalayan uh, uh, species mostly shrubs there is no tree at all and it ends uh, to the alpine meadows most of the uh, year almost 8 months it will be under snow and 4 uh, 5 months it it will be exposed all the once the snow is melted it will all emerge as a beautiful meadows uh, it is called alpine meadows the alpine meadows are the wonderful link between the uh, permafrost area the glaciers and the uh, lower vegetation area it supports uh, a variety of wildlife and uh, flowers uh, wild flowers and uh, it it manages the ecosystem uh, particularly it it is the bridge between the glaciers and the lower forest and uh, uh, the typical uh, uh, the last zone is the alpine arid zone which is uh, we call the ladakh and tibet areas which are uh, on the almost uh, the other side of the greater himalaya mostly rain shadow area there is no rain at all mostly deserts typical deserts and cold deserts but and uh, life is very difficult there only the ladakhians are certain uh, traditional people they survive they have certain specific adaptations to live in this uh, habitat otherwise we can only visit it's very difficult but nowadays large number of uh, military uh, posts are all set uh, fixed in most of this uh, arid zone uh, because it borders with the uh, the other pakistan and china area major hab habitat types uh, when we call, talk about the deciduous forest uh, evergreen forest here in western ghats and our uh, wetlands and uh, here the cold desert that is the uh, alpine cold desert i was talking about the ladakh ladakh and the other tibetan plateau area uh, next is glaciers and glacial lakes this is a peculiar system which is the source of uh, our water and uh, there are uh, many glacial lakes including the mansarovar you might have had the, that is in tibet and we have a lot of uh, similar lakes like uh, our nainital uh, this is srinagar what you call that uh, dal lake all these all glacial lakes uh, it, in winter it is all totally it will be frozen and in summer it will be water will be back and uh, alpine meadows i was just telling about uh, the grasslands of uh, two types one is the uh, typical alpine meadows above the tree line below the snow line and uh, the other meadows pastoral meadows are just below that uh, subalpine areas in the evergreen high altitude evergreen forests in between there are a lot of patches of uh, beautiful alpine uh, this, uh, this uh, pastoral meadows that is we can typically seen in nepal and uttarakhand areas uh, even in kashmir kashmir valley all this uh, meadows you can see uh, just below this uh, subalpine uh, that area the uh, sub tropical forests are there they are evergreen forest formations mostly we have a lot of uh, native oak and uh, plenty of rhododendron species below that comes the sal forest sal you may not have uh, the south indians are uh, less aware about the sal trees it is something like our teak uh, it is quite popular from the central india towards north uh, the best teak uh, sal forest we can see in the foothills of himalayas and in the up to uh, the uh, upper region and a uh, lot of human habitations and agricultural activities of uh, plantations you can see many type of uh, orchards and crop fields uh, across the landscape vegetation uh, this is a broad classification i'll uh, mention about that i uh, i already mentioned you can just note down the altitudinal uh, differences of uh, this uh, and typical uh, subtropical the base forest mostly i'll i'll uh, as a lot of students are there i will mention some of the books 
which inspired me i'll mention you can note down and uh, you can later on develop your knowledge about these things and you can travel and you can visit uh, if you read uh, jim corbett's have you heard of jim corbett i st- i first heard about uh, jim corbett from bishop bipar college the library and he was one of the famous naturalists and uh, is based on his name india's first national park was started you know what it is corbett national park in uttarakhand that is the first national park in india that is named after him uh, because of his tremendous uh, contribution in the field of nature and wildlife uh, those who are interested in nature and uh, about knowing about india and the himalayan terrain you should read one of the authentic uh, writings uh, his start from is my india uh, a best startup for uh, understanding about the food hills and the uh, himalayan culture people in the 80s but even now you can understand uh, the system how it was and now it is and uh, his other books the manages of kumayon and all those things uh, very thrilling and very interesting to know about the basic uh, understanding about the wildlife and uh, nature uh, a series of books are there jim corbett the manages of uh, kumayon it is called it is all i i think like the first book i read about uh, uh, somebody from english department introduced me that book from here in our library it was there and uh, very interesting book once you started reading those things you will automatically get into that uh, attracted towards himalayas and uh, these all the forest actually he mentions a lot about his tiger hunting and the killing uh, tracking of man eaters in the himalayas and uh, his house and his farms are still there Uh, below the Ainital area, but uh, uh, I, I must tell that actually this forest uh, is not the true forest. This is all highly degraded. This is secondary vegetation. Even the degradation started during the colonial period. All the salt it was all uh, very thick, uh, rich salt forest. It is all removed, and a lot of mining's happened in that time. And uh, what you see now in this picture is just uh, Haldwani. It is just uh, below nainital uh, this area is actually all uh, prone to heavy fire and uh, uh, yeah, uh, tremendous disturbances and it is all re- uh, secondary growth there is no tiger here now these are some of the uh, nook and corners inside this uh, area some are uh, nature always have as its own resilience resilience actually uh, the principal explained you all you may all uh, hear the nature has more resilience than we individuals uh, modernized people so nature st- it is coming back in many places it it's own this was a beauty and the much more in the early day the lower tarai forest actually these all you can see so many uh, species some sample these all uh, the phalaenopsis species is a epiphytic endemic orchid of uh, uh western himalayas eastern himalayas is uh, actually rich with orchids everywhere you cannot count it goes actually uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of orchids you can uh, list out and uh, western himalaya some of this the other thing is actually the wa- walnut horse walnut walnut uh, we have wild and as well as other thing uh, the people of uh, the uttarakhand and uh, uh, himalayas they or hill people they have a separate adaptation they cultivate actually in the warmer months immediately after the snow res- uh, retreats and melts away they cultivate in terraces wheat barley uh, buckwheat uh, peas and uh, potatoes these are the vegetables uh, they will work keep on working for four months get whatever they uh, ha- they could harvest and uh, simultaneously in the uh, eastern side kashmir uh, jammu the himachal and the kashmir side they'll cultivate uh, mostly uh, fruits this all it is all all these lands are converted into apple orchards commercial cultivation mostly these are some of the plantations it is actually the chirpine uh, chirpine is originally native himalayan important species british found that it is uh, it is a source of uh, good raw raw material 
particularly the turpentine is actually produced out of that. It is like our in Kerala, we used to tap the rubber, like that. Uh, in Himalayas, uh, uh, this chirpine is tapped for its resin, and which ultimately contributes to the production of turpentine industry in uh, uh, in India. And uh, it has produced a lot of ecological things. Once actually, the problem is, uh, I'm not actually going to give you climate change solutions. Uh, in between, I'll give some tips where we miss. Once actually money is coming, our policy makers and government, everybody, uh, we won't bother about either nature or its uh, uh, interaction with us, our bond, everything, it will go away. And uh, it, it, is, it was the same situation in, during the colonial period. And when the British found it is a source of uh, money, uh, they started removing the rhododendron and other forest and they promoted Cherpine forest. And uh, once it became a monocultural stretch in many places. Uh, in the, it, it alters the needles of the chirpine, affects actually the soil dynamics of the litter dynamics of the slopes mostly. The water is not absorbed properly and uh, there is no soil microbes if you uh, test in the soil and uh, the biodiversity is less. And uh, the reason uh, study of Wildlife Institute of India and Jeep, uh, Body Institute of Himalayan in Ecology, they somebody actually recommends to remove all this uh, chirpines. Some argue, let it be there. Let the natural resilience replace it. A lot of arguments are going on. It's a big trouble. If, even if you walk, actually, it's uh, difficult to walk. The chirpines are such a slippery thing, you will fall down. So, And uh, nothing grows underneath. You can see that actually how the monoculture. This is a state of most of the terraces now because of the alterations in the climate. Uh, all of uh, the rainfall used to be in the hills. Uh, in the al uh, sub subtropical region, there will be rain. Eight months it will be rain. And uh, the rains are not like our rains, torrential rains. Used to be very. Uh, Shower like Kulikramari, Rumba, soft, it will be very pleasant. You don't, I don't see any uh, hill people use any umbrella there. But nowadays, actually, the rains are heavy. That is a uh, problem. Rain, the, the amount of rain, uh, the, I mean, the quantity of rain has increased like anything. Uh, the number of days of rain has decreased, the amount of quantity of rain has increased. That affects actually that you can and imagine agriculture they cannot plan and uh, crops will be damaged and uh, severe washout all the uh, Himalayan soil such a this kind of terrace it will wash all these things down to the rivers or Rishikesh all these uh, Ganga Yamuna everywhere silting and ultimately Bangladesh is silted Al that that is what people depend a lot in this forest actually the, I, I mentioned the middle stretch is full of people uh, so many communities uh, right from uh, Himachal Pradesh up, up to Ch even in China China uh, somehow they are controlling that areas it's not damaged as such Bhutan is beautifully they are managing the forests are still forests I don't know somewhere we lost uh, in our policy uh, things we don't we didn't uh, as professor Edwin uh, mentioned we didn't realize our natural resources are sacred or very important or anything. Uh, only very late we are realizing, but it is too late to say for our generation. We cannot do anything, literally. I am maybe pessimistic in uh, sounding, but that is a fact. Because we already lost a lot of things. Many of us are going to die without seeing this, uh, many of these beautiful things. In our lifetime, we will be only losing. We will not gain anything. That is a message. This is all the typical of apple orchards. And you know, apple uh, is a good crop. It was introduced by uh, Europeans, again, American one uh, planter in the late uh, 80s or something in uh, Himachal. And it replaced uh, most of the natural cycle of uh, vegetation and uh, the entire Himachal and uh, portions of uh, uh, this uh, Uttarakhand and uh, even in Nepal, everywhere actually the apple, because it is a commercial crop.
good apple is uh, in himachal the kinnor valley apples are exported outside as a high demand in uh, us and other countries uh, very rich and uh, very tasty apple and it is going up i'm i'm going to tell actually in the last portion what happens to this plants plants are migrating like they are up, uh, migrating upwards the other things are uh, going away and uh, this apple is one of the things it go it, it it reached now even uh, recently i saw that the apple is cultivated in the spiti valley the, it is a desert almost here it's all there they are doing uh, drip irrigation and they are cultivating apple now that's a sad part of it the apple blossom the thing is actually the apple when uh, the commercial monocultural plantations uh, come and they are all bloom in a uh, simultaneously thousands of uh, hundreds of uh, apple gardens orchards bloom together it attracts all the pollinators you know actually it will imbalance the rest of the native forest area this is all the ecological niche you have to actually the interaction interconnectedness you have to understand that how uh, one activity because we don't think we calculate everything in terms of how much productivity comes through our crops and other gardens but on the other side actually the, it it reduces the quality a lot of birds actually the insectivorous birds follows them and uh, the actual pests will be there in the native forest the quality of forest get degraded this is all the some of the uh, instances this is the uh, prunus the plums uh, himalayan plum uh, blooming time most of the honey bees will be around here this is the nat natural forest uh, uh, natural forest of the mid level in the uh, upper uttarakhand is all you won't believe that it is actually i took uh, some time in april late april the early april immediately after the snow uh, drifting away uh, the climate uh, the temperature getting warmer the rhododendrons are the species of this uh, area but immediately it will bud and uh, it will bloom within the, the may, late april you can see that it is like a, a heavenly garden everywhere uh, we have you won't believe uh, have you seen uh, rhododendron trees any of you nilgiris daisy might have uh, very few uh, nilgiris nilagiri la poirkeengla ooti kodaikanal anga ore or species undu namakku rhododendron nilgiri ka அதே ரொம்ப அழகான ஒரு ட்ரீ இந்த ஹை அல்டிடியூட் கிராஸ் லேண்ட்ஸில் தான் இங்கேயும் இருக்கும் அது இந்த ஷோலா எவர் கிரீன் ஏரியாவில் இருக்கும் ரொம்ப பியூட்டிஃபுல் இதில் பார்க்காதவங்க அட்லீஸ்ட் அதை பாருங்க நம்ம ஊரில் உள்ள ஒரு அழகான ஹை அல்டிடியூட் தட் இஸ் த்ரீ விச் கம்ஸ் இந்த ஹையஸ்ட் ஜோன் இந்த ஷோலா ஃபாரஸ்டில் அவருடைய நியர் முக்குருத்தி நேஷ்னல் பார்க் இந்த மாதிரி இடங்களில் போனீங்கன்னா ஈவன் இன் தொட்டப்பேட்டா இஃப் யூ கேன் சி சம் மோஸ்ட் ஆஃப் த ட்ரீஸ் ஆல் கான் நோ வெரி ஃபியூ ரிமன் ரெம்னன்ஸ் ஆர் தேர் with the uh, bloom kodaikanal also you can see in uh, uh, some of the grassland sites it's a beautiful species and you know we have the entire south india we have only one species of rhododendron in the himalayan we have around 110 species of rhododendron of various size various uh, in habitats from the epiphyte to ground uh, trees shrubs all range uh, rhododendrons are there because uh, why i am mentioning is actually it is one of the keystone species of himalayas uh, uh, that tells and very sensitive also uh, climate uh, biologists uh, mostly they look some of the keystone species for uh, understanding the climate condition rhododendron is one of that because actually it is very sensitive to temperature because you can see that uh, one week if you miss the uh, snow changing period in uh, my late may or uh, april you will miss actually the typical budding and flowering area that will quite fast it will be such a very sensitive plant all species of rhododendron they are such an indicator based on that actually the uh, natural pollinators will also migrate along with it and the eastern himalaya is the richest the western himalaya the rhododendron diversity is a bit less uh, some around uh, 10 15 species but it is going towards the east sikkim arunachal and uh, bhutan nepal and uh, chinese region the kunmi you can see uh, 70 80 our arunachal i think recorded 40 species or something rhododendron uh, sikkim also have 32 species or 34 species and 
and uh, Bhutan has 40, 48 species or something they have recorded. Still new species are emerging in the Rhododendra. Uh, this, is one, this is in Uttarakhand, uh, just about uh, below the Tunganath area. It's a beautiful area. The, this is all you can, anybody can visit. Uh, anybody can travel from uh, Dharadun or uh, Rishikesh, you can actually, it's a, some five, six hours travel, you can go to these places and beautiful places, good ecosystem, lot of bird watchers and bird photographers nowadays roam around in this area, it became a post-COVID actually, it's a big uh, rush in this area for observing selective Himalayan fauna. The people of that, they are uh, very much actually the, uh, the rhododendron forest, uh, I must uh, tell that that is very, very important uh, habitat. It is uh, two species dominate there. The oaks, it is called the vegetation is uh, itself is called like uh, oak rhododendron forest. The oak leaves are, uh, they supply to the Himalayan population for uh, their fodder and uh, their manure and uh, their livelihood, the entire livelihood, everything actually the oak uh, contributes to that. And uh, uh, these are the uh, lower pastoral meadows, all these people actually the shepherds, even uh, in the cold period actually the snow uh, comes up to the uh, this uh, tree line in the winter. So the shepherds everything, the trans Himalayan shepherd we call it as, they are all will migrate. There is uh, millions of sheep, goats are reared in the upper Himalayas, the Gujas and so many communities they are, they are nomadic communities. In the summer they will keep on moving towards upper upon receding the snow uh, uh, for the fresh new grass uh, with uh, millions of goat they will move upwards and in the so we winter when they uh, started actually they all will retreat to the lower altitude, altitude. here this, uh, this kind of meadows will support them uh, for grazing and other things this is all the uh, this is the Kedarnath wildlife sanctuary Chopta, Tunganath and Badrinath area, you can see uh, this kind of meadows. This is a typical uh, flora of uh, this oak rhododendron forest. That's the uh, rhododendron I was talking about. Our Nilgiri rhododendron is exactly like this. And uh, Viga, I, I was mentioning about uh, uh, hundreds of varieties. Uh, 93 official species and plus some varieties are there. Uh, this is all like uh, the eastern side and see this is the snow line area you can see the bloom time everywhere you can see flowers uh, nothing else. Uh, it will remain for almost 15-20 uh, days like this. Everywhere it will be blooming uh, flowers. Such a beautiful amazing sight. Uh, the another interesting is the Berberis we have some uh, 12, 12 species even in South India we have in Nilgiris and I, our western guards we have berberries but the Himalayan berberries is a medicinal plant as well as uh, it, it, it's an important species for all the birds uh, and other fauna. Himalayan monal uh, flax uh, species. Have you heard of this bird? Yes, this is actually a state bird of uh, Uttarakhand and uh, a few other Himachal also I think and it's a national bird of uh, Nepal. It was once uh, endangered, now it, the population is stable and uh, it is a family. It, 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 it is much larger than the, our domestic fowl, almost a 2 kg. Heavy bird and very tough bird. It is the only among we have around 6 uh, or so pheasants. Uh, the, uh, this is the only bird which can uh, survive in the alpine snow. It used to go and dig in the snow and uh, get in the buried uh, straw and other things they eat, uh, the buried things. Very powerful and very, uh, very colorful bird of the Himalayas. These are all the other interesting pheasants because why I am concentrating the birds, if I am talking about that will take a long time, a uh, lot of time and this is uh, the, some of pheasants are actually the soil engineers again. They deal with the ground flora of uh, forest and uh, that works a lot. Actually, they, these are some of the interesting. Uh, this uh, Western Trogopan is again endemic and endangered, and uh, they are found in the um, Great Himalayan National Park uh, in Spiti Valley and uh, those areas. Very beautiful bird. 
uh, it is all uh, during colonial period it was all hunted like anything for their color feathers and meat and nowadays actually it is all protected the population is stable in the protected area unfortunately they are not moving uh, the, the, all the other areas are encroached by human everywhere uh, we call it as development uh, and the government is blaming on the simple farmers and other people but government the damage the extent of damage government is making through dams hydel projects military bases that is all huge it is not coming into the account and uh, we always actually talk about the people are damaging agriculture pastoral people are damaging the ecosystem their uh, deforestation is due to the people it is not not so the government is actually the major uh, culprit the policy makers and uh, the Cheer percent is also an endemic one because the plantation comes, uh, the population is reduced. Another beautiful percent. Uh, the Kalit and Kokla uh, share with the Kokla percent is a beautiful and uh, percent you can see in uh, again Uttarakhand. Most of the photographs you can take, even anybody can uh, who can take a good photograph, you can take this in Chopta area, uh, Kedarnath Wildlife Sanctuary. They are all very friendly. Uh, you can get Monal and this all. another interesting uh, pheasant black pheasant uh, it's a very rare it is a bird of a state bird of arunachal pradesh it is actually found mostly in the arunachal and chinese area mostly hunted and in our area it is protected some part of nepal also it is available bhutan it is there it's a beautiful bird himalayan thar it's a uh, very close cousin of our nilgiri thar our state animal of tamil nadu this is a himalayan thar with uh, with a lot of uh, fur to manage in the winter and uh, it is all you know very you, you can imagine that it is himalayas is i was telling that it is about 2500 km stretch from uh, afghanistan to china but they cannot actually move across all this 2500 km these all living in a very very different habitat specialist all uh, the maybe they have this black pheasant i was telling it is about confined to a particular small patches of uh, the arunachal and bhutan that area like that this nilgiri uh, himalayan thar is almost uh, it's all habitat is gone uh, kedarnath wildlife sanctuary and the tunganath uh, the kedarnath that area only we can see uh, they are sustaining with the remaining grass and cliffs this is a winter in uh, the oak rhododendron forest uh, the, the the face will totally change and uh, the uh, grass alpine floor is completely covered with the snow Actually, I took this in uh, uh, end of uh, winter. Uh, 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 overnight snowstorm changed the landscape into this, like this. The Himalayan climate is such a way. This is an uh, alpine zone. Uh, a little bit above of this, I was uh, mentioning about the, the typical no broadleaf trees, only the deodars and pine forest. We have uh, some interesting pines, Valley Chiana. And uh, the chirpine, uh, the chirpine is a lower ele elevation. The blue pine and uh, some pines are uh, cones are edible. The people collect and eat. Some most of the pines uh, pines are uh, medicinal. Some of them are uh, they like turpentine. The other junipers and other all uh, they give a lot of fragrance and other things. Some of the deodars and other habitats, high altitude. Uh, a greater himalaya alpine zone mostly uh, the kargil uh, and the uh, upper manali region spiti areas typically it looks like that you can see that there is uh, this is a meadow there is no trees here and uh, snow line is this one and this is the evidence actually uh, most of the people are telling that how snow recedes and uh, how exposed this all the things see this this much of area is exposed uh, but uh, this photograph you need not uh, believe this changes overnight there will be snow uh, snow will cover this area and uh, but the, uh, the geological survey of india and the himalayan himalayan institute of uh, the wadia institute of himalayan ecology gp pent institute of himalayan ecology they are all monitoring actually himalayan ecosystem continuously for the past uh, several years and uh, they have been telling that actually the, the width is increasing in some places particularly in the western himalayas e, uh, i mean eastern himalayas western himalayas the uh, snow and the glaciers are stable somewhat 
and the eastern himalayas it is all the gap is increasing that is what actually everybody is worrying globally the glo climate change is actually uh, significant in this uh, area and uh, how it, it is affecting that is all the question see the meadows and the tree line uh, uh, some of the alpine meadows and uh, you can see that actually you cannot explain it why meadows alpine meadows below and uh, conifers are up, up in in the next slope if you see that uh, meadows are up conifers are here that is why actually the micro habitats are different uh, changing like anything in each every valley is different uh, in the upper himalayas <coughs> these are some of the uh, above 4000 i think this is about uh, 4500 meters elevation oxygen is much less when the tree uh, line is uh, reduced or removed the oxygen level will be the trees has to there uh, to emit oxygen you cannot walk fast here it's a very uh, uh, many people will get giddiness uh, our uh, low altitude people if you go there will get all mountain sickness in this area walking is very difficult you have to breathe less uh, you cannot breathe fast and uh, but it has a very interesting actually flora some kind of sedges and grass and uh, mostly no uh, vegetation area this all the ground floor of uh, this area and uh, immediately after the snow retail uh, uh, some of the beautiful primulas actually we have so many primulas everywhere you can see across the himalayas in the meadows such a beautiful flower uh, these are the primulas we have uh, so many varieties again uh, yellow uh, red uh, so many color colorful uh, you know uh, the, you, you might be knowing all the scene uh, these things in gardens these all during the colonial period all these flowers are taken to the uh, royal uh, botanical garden in uh, england and they hybrided it in uh, say, they spread it throughout europe now. Uh, because most of the plants are actually hooker and many other famous our botanists they stole all these things from our himalayas uh, they set up actually royal botanical garden in calcutta that's a bsi headquarters now that not to conserve plants that time to exploit maximum himalayan uh, this uh, flowering plants and medicinal plants including tea uh, they set up the botanical survey of india and uh, but the remnants are still here our geraniums and uh, these all very rare plants still uh, the uh, remnants are there some uh, endangered and endemic uh, species are there this is from uh, just near kargil this plant is a very uh, rare and end endangered plant and <coughs> this is from uh, uh, somewhere in nepal i think geranium it's all endangered this is from ladakh uh, it is all uh, very interesting species butterflies i put very i'm sorry very sorry daisy actually over here yeah i put very minimum slides there are so many uh, talking about butterflies because butterflies are associated with the uh, highly associated with the meadows of uh, himalayas and uh, they are the indicators again how meadows change how butterflies shifts this all lot of there are many studies and very interesting things this all everybody is nowadays linking with the climate and uh, it's a vast area i'm just telling that butterflies are one of the uh, interesting species very common butterfly this is in himalayas everywhere you can see the uh, meadow butterfly and this is another interesting species coming to the mammal this is a pika himalayan pika one of my favorite animal in the himalayas it is like a rabbit tailless rabbit you can call it is between the mouse elico muyalku edayil ulla or species it's a beautiful cute species really cute not only its appearance its behavior it selects actually the only high altitude native plants and it decorates its house with the flowers and many things such a beautiful cute animal and it is highly threatened due to the climate change because the uh, its food species include some 80 species of himalayan herbs all and uh, those species are replaced by the lower uh, uh, our our normal invasive invasive plant, plants and crops and other things so they are moving away and when they they are very delicate animals again uh, they they play a vital role in the himalayan uh, food chain that is why for the uh, uh, predator birds as well as the tibetan uh, wolf and all sort of uh, this uh, predators this is the main prey species and uh, when they are uh, easily they when they get, when they go for searching more they live in the open areas in the burrows and when they go a little more uh, in the open grasslands for the thing easily they will get prey population is uh, 
are not good in many places we have many endemic species also this is a typical uh, upper area in the greater himalayan areas most of the areas we make roads uh, for, for the uh, defense and army purpose this is a nuzila pass like we have many passes like this in every part of the himalayan central himalayas uh, this is the main part uh, lifeline between ladakh and kashmir uh, year round actually it is open the army maintains the, during the winter it is fully covered every day the truck uh, the bulldozer goes and cl uh, cleans the way and uh, so that the goods are transported to ladakh region and uh, this is in ladakh though it is a arid desert area uh, there is no water something like as such in the typical desert we have some oases in between there people live uh, the only two species of trees you can see is the poplars and the uh, willows and the uh, entire they even they call palaces actually the mud houses big and that is all constructed with the uh, typical uh, river uh, sediments and the poplar trees uh, highly uh, the, the just survive with this two species uh, willows and uh, thing now the third one apple is going there uh, it's all the typical small hamlets of the uh, ladakh and nubra valley all the high up high altitude region typical ladakhi people such a beautiful lovely hosp uh, hospitalizing people this is another keystone species uh, the apex predator the snow leopard it was very rare to see peter matheson another important person i am uh, telling no doubt uh, try to read his snow leopard it's a very famous book legendary book in the 70s he, he went in search for the, the to photograph this that time actually it is called the ghost animal because when it was walking through the snow you cannot identify it all it will see you but you can never never see that such a highly camouflaged animal uh, now my friends are studying that in uh, spiti valley the population is stable the snow leopard foundation they started from the wildlife institute of india and uh, their population from uh, western himalayas is uh, much stable and uh, good but some problems actually due to the, again they are linking with the climate change uh, the prey the himalayan shepherds are coming down and uh, its main prey is the blue sheep which is why i show the next slide that is also coming down so in search of the prey this most of the snow leopards are moving down and uh, accidentally enter into the villages getting conflict with the humans and it is somewhere hill, uh, killed but whereas in the eastern himalayas it is hunted like anything it is uh, all going into china traditional medicine and the fur is very valuable such a cute uh, cat this is its typical uh, prey the highly camouflaged uh, uh, sheep the blue sheep it is called barrel and uh, the female and young if it is uh, like that it is again very difficult to see only if it moves you can see that otherwise you cannot understand uh, there will be uh, it is a typical prey of this uh, snow leopard and population is okay and uh, this is a typical further uh, arid zones inside in winter you cannot enter into uh, in this area so now summer you can see but the peak you can see exposed to exposed all normally uh, if you read all this uh, uh, some of the literature uh, uh, the british accounts a lot of way about himalayan uh, trekking mountaineering all uh, many books are there and uh, most of the peaks were filled with snow permanent snow many places uh, it is all like mini glaciers glaciers are coming down and this is all exposed to most of these areas these areas are known for salt himalayan salt you can hear that uh, himalayan rock salt all this small uh, uh, the glacier lakes some of them are all salty in taste because of the uh, leaching out this is the cold desert uh, typical uh, cold desert of uh, nubra valley and uh, it is between the karakoram and the uh, uh, karbungla area it is historically very significant area the ancient tray uh, silk route was passing through the tajikistan and all the uh, they uh, used the uh, mules and the double hump camel they used to travel uh, trade across using this this is the route actually they were traveling to china all the way you can go and uh, yaks are also used in this area uh, the double hump camels actually some of the villages are still there in uh, tutuk the northernmost our village in the nubra valley uh, there uh, they just they became actually two spots now no more using in trade and other things but you can see the double hump camel in india in those areas 
the indus actually the river passes through this uh, this is the you know this is the wild ass kaatukaiyada and we have two species in india one is in the little run of kutch uh, this is a different uh, genetic variety this is in the himalayas in the high up in the cold desert tibetan wild ass it is called kyam there they live uh, they survive with the harsh sub area this is another very interesting area of the uh, high altitude uh, alpine and uh, ladakh tibet ladakh area this is a mar himalayan marmot marmots are uh, another ground mammal very interesting mammal there it so uh, it is a prey for uh, even lammergeier and uh, lot of uh, predators and very interesting they used to they are the soil engineers there in the arid zone uh, they hibernate also in the winter uh, they will hibernate other times actually they will uh, live along the streams and marshy areas in the alpine meadows uh, they are bur burrowing animals the high altitude shepherds you can see uh, the himalayan sheep the himalayan your uh, himalayan shawl wool everything comes from uh, How much time more? One forty-five. My God, I will go. <laughs> this is. Uh, I, I, I haven't actually finished half of the slides. I think anyway. Uh, this is the uh, high altitude uh, Ladakh area. The Sibukthan is very famous. It's a medicinal and uh, a lot of things they are taking. This is a. Uh, it's not a typical yak. This is a hybrid of yak and uh, cow. And most of the high altitude, uh, our cow, our cattle would survive. We have some two, three hybrids of the yak. Uh, this is one of the uh, habitat specialist bird. Nowadays, actually, climate change specialist uh, are indicating that this all ca came out of the forest. This is no more seen in the forest. Mostly, they they come into the which uh, human habitats like crow, uh, the yellow-billed blue magpie, a beautiful bird of the Himalayas. Some uh, tree pie or a ray cousin. These all other habitat specialists in the high altitude, the Himalayan snowcock and uh, the bearded vulture, Lammergeier, and uh, the griffon. These all the typical uh, habitat specialists. Uh, they are changing the, the the population status is changing, and uh, uh, that is the Eurasian magpie mostly found in the eastern Himalayan side. Uh, that is also coming out of uh, forest habitat, the natural habitat. That is mostly uh, living. They are mostly in the west dumping areas. Area, Himalayan glaciers. I have to tell. I am not uh, going detail. And uh, we have uh, some of the largest glaciers. Glaciers are the compact, packed ice which won't melt much. Eighty uh, percent of the packed ice will be remaining. The outer, it is called the mouth part, will be melting uh, to one meter or something, and it will uh, form the source of our Ganga, Yamuna, all these inters rivers. Glaciers we have many, and the Indus River and the Ganga many originate from the Siachen. Uh, Gangotri Glacier is the source of uh, Ganga, and uh, very thickly packed ice. And uh, somewhere the thickness will be two to three meters, and uh, the length will be this uh, largest in India, the Siachen Glacier, 74 kilometers long. This, this is the second largest single ice pack outside the polar area. The first one is again next to that in. Uh, Afghanistan, that Pamir area, Afghanistan, Tajikistan area. That is uh, that is not much uh, difference. This is the uh, 74 kilometers. That is 77 kilometers. That's all. This is quite large uh, glacier. This is a permanent source of our water and our temperature, everything, Himalayan climate, everything. If the glacier is gone, uh, the uh, India will be like a desert. Uh, all these things. These are some of the. of the glaciers this is the kanchanjunga one of our uh, large uh, field glacier in the eastern himalayas the eastern face of the jammuji glacier in the uh, nepal our uh, darjeeling near darjeeling area pindar pindari glacier this is one of the highly talked about glacier which is uh, melting because of all the global uh, climate change scientists are worrying about this one this is uh, they are telling that it is uh, receding very fast For the past uh, 40 years or something, some uh, 25 kilometer, uh, 25 250 meters, it has receded. Normally, the glaciers actually what will happen is the glacier uh, study is very interesting. It will accumulate in the during the winter, the outer cover, and uh, during the summer it will release water slowly, but the core is stored always. But here some of the reserves like Arctic, it is melting. That is what actually people are worried. But 
some scientists actually they are telling that it is not so as we are hearing uh, it is changing behavior uh, some places actually gangotri and this one is melting but the other glaciers are remaining still not much changes this is a typical uh, high altitude road again i was telling that our army track and this is a this is a typical road from kashmir lake road it, it is a, you must remember that it is in the early summer in winter you can imagine the the walls of snow will be 11 12 15 feet uh, it will be very very interesting and dangerous these are the army posts everywhere you can see in the high altitude fragile himalayan human beings are allowed but uh, these people are everywhere there and they their camp sheds and uh, all sort of activities everything is there their trucks the, the traffic of himalayan army our indian army truck truck traffic is actually like anything that i uh, personally believe that the himalayan climate changes fast <laughs> they are indian army <laughs> and uh, in the single can canoe you can see that 18 90 trucks going for hour together in the upper fragile uh, and they make roads in many places every year they change the route these are some of the interesting glacial lakes the glaciers melt and form some uh, beautiful uh, lakes the glacial lakes uh, in winter uh, you can just run around on them they such as totally frozen and winter that will be there uh, the, uh, no fishes mostly in this glacial lakes uh, certain uh, 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 diatom Gulls are actually going there, visiting all the various sorts of crustaceans. What happens to our flora? This vegetation, I am telling that these are the uh, things you can uh, understand. Uh, vegetation, uh, as I told, the meadows are changing. Uh, some uh, lower altitude plants are moving up, uh, and particularly the uh, this point actually you can note down. This is one important thing. The, they call it as actually the plant groups. They categorize into C3 and C4 plants. Our normal our vegetation everywhere. and storing mechanism is different from the highest to the lowest plants they just actually convert the some of the oxygen into directly into sugar and store uh, some of the nutrients that is why actually more many of them are uh, different by different uh, than others and those plants are actually because the, the climate is getting warmer and those plants are disappearing our plants are moving up this uh, losing the oxygen uh, that is a big uh, uh, issue in the some many uh, himalayan plants they are actually thinking that because of the early uh, the, the temperature change they or the rain they think that actually the the, the season comes early and they lose and uh, the fruits are not much quality and those things are happening pollinators are also not coming in many places uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, snow decline of snowfall in many places instead rain is there because that changes lot of things Himalayas, the houses are all with mud. There is no rain, never. The rain when it comes actually it will before falling into the ground that will become the snow globe. All uh, so uh, the mud houses are not uh, a problem. Nowadays actually that is all melting like snow. All the monasteries, the age-old uh, Buddhist monasteries are all like uh, the Ayam uh, Kumari Lama area because of the uh, intensity the rain drops and. crop yield are in the lower stretch actually uh, uh, reducing so people are going for more hybrid plants hybrid crops cloud bus you might have heard actually uttarakhand flood often nowadays for except i think for the covid period actually it is uh, not much before that every year we can hear that uttarakhand flood uh, cloud bus because of that and uh, it washes away all the nonsense in the upper area to the down and i am coming to the end i am not uh, there is so many so many as himalayas is a vast area i have uh, reduced i know that i prepared for uh, some uh, 30 40 minutes and uh, this is the thing actually this is the theme of our uh, climate change uh, uh, india has set up uh, this uh, the national action plan and this is the mission uh, they are working on they spent lot of uh, crores of money uh, for that UNEP is also funding in that to protect. Actually, Professor Edwin was telling about, the, explained about the story of environmental and the climate uh, the summit and all sort of things. And uh, this is the outcome actually of Himalayan thing. Based on that, I, I just put it in five points. Uh, what are our government is actually thinking and uh, uh, so many institutes.
sir working in the Himalayan area Institute of Wildlife Institute of India and uh, Forest Institute uh, that is in Dehradun where I trained and uh, in many other uh, high fi institutes all having millions of dollar funds and all projects to observe se separately each and everything butterfly, birds, plants, uh, everything they have uh, soil, so many studies are going, they are all looking into the thing, wildlife conservation, everything and uh, so we are working, we have so many research stations are there, so many research scholars are there, so many uh, students are studying about this. That is the story of that for conservation. But whatever it is, the final message I would say that consume less, consume only for your own use, not for your greed. That will save the climate. Uh, you cannot actually the save the larger climate, at least you save yourself without uh, disease and other things. I will stop with this. I think uh, any questions actually. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the amazing virtual tour across the Himalayas. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We shall now disperse for lunch. Food is being served in the old auditorium downstairs near the library. I request everyone to be back in the same hall for the, for the next technical session, which will commence at 2.30 p.m.